Well, good morning, good morning. People collect many different things, baseball, cards, whatever. I collect friends. And I would like to introduce you to one of my precious friends, Andy Andreas, this morning. A mutual friend of ours called Doug, who lives in San Diego, California, gave me Andy's contact information about three years ago and said, Ivan, you should meet Andy. I called Andy, and he told me his story. At the end of the conversation, I said, Andy, I want to be your friend. I'm going to call you every month until you tell me not to. And I called him for nine months, and then eventually we had the opportunity to meet. A couple of fun facts about Andy. He went to probably the smallest state university in the nation that is only slightly larger than Greenville uh, in Nebraska uh, to be a shop teacher. Uh, he later on studied a master's in Bible and theology at the Talbot School of Theology at uh, Biola University. He chose that institution because he didn't have to wear a tie. <laughs> he is married to Becky, and they have a lovely daughter called Hannah. I will not tell you the rest of his story. I'm not sure what he will say. So, Andy, the countdown clock is there. I pointed out to you for the very reason that we finish at 10.20, and I love you. Is Ivan Philby a stud or what? I love the guy. <laughs> um, totally stoked to be with you today. Um, I, was, I was thinking, um, Lord, what did you want me to share with the, the folks at Greenville? And um, the Lord kind of basically said, I, I want you to tell them what you wish someone would have told you when you were 20-something. And so, um, you know, the, one of the things that's really confounded me my entire life is like, what is going on? You know, just that, that question around, you know, we're born into this world that's broken and fallen, and, and my heart wants to put entrench itself here and find something to satisfy itself and it never really seems to really work out correctly and stuff like that. So I've spent a tremendous amount of time trying to figure out like what is actually going on and I feel like I finally came up with a, with a system that is very biblically sound and what the Lord is up to and what he's doing with our life and what the value proposition of our life um, should look like or could look like. Um, so I just, that's why I got the whiteboard up here. I just thought it'd be a lot easier. So um, anyways, um, you know, you're born into uh, a really wild time. You're born into America, the richest nation in the history of the world at the zenith of its wealth, which kind of tips you off that there might be something you're supposed to do, right? Because it's an opportunity, right? So you're, you're along the line here somewhere, you're, um, you're born, say you're born in 1990, and you live your life, and at some point, you know, you'll die, and what's, what's the point, right? What's, what's going on? What's God asking me to do with my life? And so, um, so as you move through life, at some point, if you take Jesus Christ up on his offer of sonship, and it's a pretty sweet offer. He says, hey, look, I will take all of your sins, if you want to confess them to me, I'll take all of your sins, I'll make you my child, and you'll spend eternity with me in a wonderful place. I'm going to give you a brand new body. Um, it is going to be phenomenal. I'm going to give you sonship, unmerited favor, all this kind of stuff. So at the point of salvation, the Lord essentially gives you what I simply call a base package. Right? So you get a base package. At the very moment that you make that, you take Jesus up on his offer to be his kid, um, something really significant happens. Um, you get gifts. Okay? And if you're, if you're Andy Andreas, um, and there's about 27 different gifts. If you're Andy Andreas, your gifts are wisdom, evangelism, giving, exhortation. Right? Now, the, the think correctly about spiritual gifts. They are very, very different. But what they are is they give you the ability to conduct kingdom commerce in God's eternal kingdom. Because right now, since Jesus came into this world and the, and the Holy Spirit has invaded the world, we live, in a, we live in a kind of a dualistic time, right? There's evil, the world's fallen, but the Spirit is here and he's redeeming men from the world. 
okay? So the moment of salvation, the Lord gives you spiritual gifts. These spiritual gifts are very different from each other, as different as a scalpel is from a backhoe, right? They're very, very different. So those are your essential tools for kingdom commerce. We all have opportunities to do some general good in our lives, but those specific um, gifts that you've been given, you'll want to pay attention to because they're where you're going to have unusual impact, okay? So you take this, um, this zone from the time you were saved until you die, and what happens is, is you create kingdom commerce, okay? So there's a, there's a bucket over here that's basically commissions. Now, Jesus said, talked a whole lot about eternity, and he gave us commands. He said, store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where there's no moth, no thief, no rust, okay? So kind of like on this, side of the, on this side of the equation, it, it starts to look a little bit like you might start to assume that heaven is totally socialistic or communistic, right? Maybe you could say that here, but it is so not over here. It's crazy, okay? So Jesus commands us, store up treasures in heaven, no moth, no thief, no rust, okay? The, the rich young ruler comes up to Christ whom Jesus loved, and um, Jesus starts quizzing this guy, and it says, Jesus really liked this guy, really sharp guy. Um, the guy's like, what do I have to be saved? Jesus quizzes him all this stuff, and Jesus says, you lack one thing. You lack treasure in heaven. My recommendation is, is that you sell everything, follow me, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Jesus talks a lot about having treasure and heaven and that we should be thinking about it, okay? So um, when we, so the rich young ruler passes on the deal for whatever reason. Some people would say it, it, was, it was greedy. Some would say his power was so tied into it he couldn't let it go. So he passes on a deal. Two sentences later, Peter's right there and Peter's like, hey, wait a minute. What is in it for us? This rich guy you, you promised him unspeakable wealth. What's in it for us? And Jesus said, anybody who does anything for me ever, I repay a hundredfold on the commission side. A hundredfold. I hear, I hear that number and I just like, it really grabs me because there's a lot of different motivations that people have that we've kind of figured out. And mine is to make a gain. I don't want to, I don't want to waste my time. <laughs> if I'm going to do something, I want it to pan out, you know? And so there's um, unspeakable craziness happening over on the commission side that I'm very caught up in. <laughs> and I feel like biblically I'm actually supposed to be and I'm commanded to be. So um, as I'm rolling through my life and I'm, I'm living this obedient opera. Uh, um, obedient life, and these opportunities arise, and I use my spiritual jujitsu over here because I'm like good at this, right? So I use that inside inside the bucket, right? And as I live obediently, there's really three motivations that the Christian life has. Okay, they are, or yes, three motivations: fear, okay, godly awe. When you realize that God Almighty is the epicenter of everything that is, okay? God Almighty created sunlight, and I don't know what I'm more impressed with, the fact that he thinks this stuff up or he speaks it into existence. I mean, it's mind-boggling, right? And so all beauty that is in the galaxy that was built in six days, all of it, all electricity, all, you know, how God makes this rock, how he thinks this up. I'm going to make this rock. It's going to spin perfectly. It's going to go around the sun. And because it's going to tilt different, it's going to have seasons. I'm like blown away at the intelligence and the beauty of the Godhead, right? So, um, so anyways, um, I use my, my, my gifts. I create kingdom commerce. They kick down in this bucket over here. What wars or goes for my, goes for my mind or my attention inside this bucket? We have three enemies. We have the devil, we have the world, and we have our own personal flesh that wants what it wants when it wants it. Okay, the world is essentially the spirit of nowism. You can have it 
now. You want it now. Do not think about that. It's all here right now, baby. Get your chunk, right? And it, I think today it manifests itself in three ways heavily. One is in power. People want power now. Um, I think another one that's taken a really firm grip is actually pornography because you can have that now. Just look, bam, click, there it is, right? And it's all now. And the other one I think is fame, eats us up, right? So all these things are war, that spirit of now is in wars against the thought of eternity, which I'll just simply put up here. Okay, so you live your life, and at the very end, if you've taken Jesus Christ up on his offer of salvation of like, hey, I'll take all your sins and make you my, make you my son, you'll live forever in eternity. I'm like, okay, I'll take that. That is such a sweet deal, right? So at the end of life, um, there are two judgments. One is the bema, okay? The bema seed judgment, which is for believers, and this is what gets tested, okay? What's up for grabs on a good bema showing, right? Here's what it is. It's three things. It is the size of the domain that you will rule forever in paradise. It's a very big place. And the kingdom of God is extremely, extremely wealthy. Incredible wealth, okay? You walk on gold. This is something to get pumped about. <laughs> Heaven is killer, okay? So you have domains up for grabs. You have... Um, honor from God. There are crowns talked about a lot. So when you take it for the kingdom and you live a Christ-centered kind of life, there are crowns that go with it. And it's fascinating. Um, people that are martyrs get a certain crown. Apparently they must stack inside of each other somehow. But I mean, it is a glory that does not fade. That's the thing you want to remember about eternity. This is where you want to set your mind. Okay, and the last, uh, the last reward at the Bema Seat is intimacy with Christ. Okay, remember this Godhead, all wisdom, all knowledge, all beauty, and what do people in the Psalms say all the times? I just want to gaze at your beauty because God is phenomenally beauty, the epicenter of all that is beauty. I mean, you think about this guy, he coughs almost, it's a little bit of exaggeration, like he breathes into Adam the breath of life and here we all are, and we just keep multiplying. <laughs> I mean, the guy's got it going on, right? Just with breath, okay? So, um, um, any questions about this at all? I actually have some notes for myself. I want to make sure I don't miss anything. Um, so, when I, when I look at my life and what I was, um, how I maximized um, opportunities. Um, I was born into a home and I won at Parent Lottery. My mom was this amazing soul winner who um, I saw her lead no less than 200 people to the Lord in my lifetime. She would just like have them over and it was just like totally normal that she would lead all these people to the Lord. And we really connected on that because that's kind of the same way. My dad robbed the cradle, had kids really late. He actually was like this Omaha Beach World War II guy. And they had four kids in four and a half years and I was the third kid. Um, and so I had two older brothers, um, born and raised in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, I got saved when I was six years old. It was like, hey, do you want to... Do you want to go to HE Double Toothpick? I'm like, no way. I'll take that plan. Took it and really never, um, really never wandered away. But the great thing about my parents is they gave me really this understanding, um, but nobody ever really drew it out for me before. So I, um, I, in high school, I was this football player. Um, and I remember there was this unbelievably key moment in my life where I was in junior high and I was going to high school, and the writing was on the wall. I mean, I was like, football was my thing. And so um, I, had to, I, had, I was at this crossroad of like, I, I'm going to go like the world way, or I'm going to go Christ's way. And this guy gets up at church camp and says, hey, if you want to follow God your entire life, and basically this is what he was asking me for, was a permanent yes it was like this lordship decision. So, but what I was signing up for was that no matter what the Lord ever said or asked me my entire life, it was going to be the answer permanently forever is yes. <laughs> the consecrated life, right? And so I was, um, 
I was seated in the second row, second person in, just like the girl in the cardinal shirt there. And this guy makes this offer, and man, it was like God just like, went, like out of the seat. And I'm like, oh yeah, man, I'm totally, I'm doing this thing. And so, um, and I, I thought everyone was going to come down, and I was like the only guy that came down. And I've often thought the Lord is like, well... We got one, you know, got to do a lot with one, you know. So I kind of blame that for how my life's went since. So I um, went and um, lived for the Lord in high school. I never, I, I to, honestly, I, I was, I got married at 47 and I was a virgin the day I got married. And you know what? You know why I did it? I did it for the reward. I did. I can have nowism or I can have the kingdom of God and I will take the kingdom of God every time because it's incomprehensible the upside of what I get for obedience. So there, that's just one example of, of how the fear of God, knowing that he sees everything and I get away with nothing and I'm only being duped if I, if I settle for the nowism and try to create my own happiness now. So, uh, so then I went on and I, uh, I got a degree to be a high school woodshop teacher and um, I worked four years in industry, and then I went to um, Talbot School of Theology, crazy story, ended up there. Uh, it was a great experience. And then I went to Kansas City, and um, I started selling remodeling projects because everyone was always like, you should be in sales, man. It's totally your deal. And so I got a job selling for Sears Home Central. And um, about... Um, I, you know, I was there doing that for like a year and a half, and I was this good average guy that any sales manager would want on this team. And um, I came to this place, it's almost like crisis in faith, where it's like, hey, what good is God in my life? Because I'm this average guy, there's no X factor, where's the Holy Spirit? I mean, shouldn't I be great at what I do because I'm a child of the King, and I walk with God? Um, and that really... That really bothers me. And so, um, so I went to God and I said, I don't think I'm utilizing you. I don't think I'm walking with you correctly. I don't know what it is, but I just, there's no evidence of you in my work performance. And so um, I just kept after him with that question. And I saw this verse that changed everything. Um, it said, Jesus increased with favor with both God and man. So I was like, oh, there it is. Jesus was great at this. So I... Um, I said, I'm going to increase with favor with God. I'm going to read the Bible for one solid hour every morning at six in the morning at a coffee shop that nobody goes to. And then I'm going to pray for 15 minutes and I'm going to sit silent because I need to discern the Lord's voice. And all indications everywhere in the Bible is that I can have a conversational relationship with God and I want to develop that. I got to be able to talk to this guy. Why wouldn't it be like that? It's always been like that. It's there for the taking. It's just, you got to focus in on it, right? And so I started that and then I called the owner of this branch of Sears Home Central and I said, hey, I feel like I should be good but I'm just kind of average. I go, can you help me be better? Because this guy was famous at polishing sales guys off. And he said, um, he goes, he got really abrupt on the phone and he said, um, two conditions. Number one, you do exactly everything I tell you to do. It's not a conversation. And number two, when you attempt to do what I tell you to do, you have to tell me what actually happens or you're wasting my time. <laughs> I said, okay, cool, I'm in. You know, so he goes, tell me what you're doing in the home. So I tell the guy, he goes, you need to change this, this, and this. I said, okay. So I changed that. And, um, and then like a couple of weeks later, he called me back. He goes, you need to change some things. I changed them. And I become the number one closer in the nation for Sears Home Central because of my walk with the Lord. Because I was spending all that time with him, right? And, and walking in his spirit as I did my job. So then... Um, um, which was really a weird thing to have your income go fourfold like that. Um, so then I went and um, I finished out the year and um, Sears canceled all these licensees that were doing all these, um, all the work for them. And so the owner guy calls me up, he says, hey, um, Sears canceled the license, we're instantaneously out of business. And I said, okay totally get it, no problem. And we have this conversation and I hang up the receiver and as the receiver hits the deal and cancels the call, God says to me like audibly, he says, I want you to start a company. And I said, 
I don't want to start a company. <laughs> I don't know anything about that kind of stuff. You know, I'm just a closer, right? And so, um, so anyways, I go in the back room and we have this conversation for like a solid hour. And truth be known, I was just petrified to do it because remodeling companies go out of business, like 98% of them are out of business every five years. Like you have a 2% chance of surviving over five years. And so, um, you know, Moses actually got God to change his mind. So in my book, Moses is the greatest closer in the history of the world because I tried with everything I had and I couldn't budge the guy. I mean, he was just like, now I want you to start a company. And we talked about this for an hour. And I've learned that the Lord loves, loves, loves me pouring out my heart to him about how I feel and what it's like to be me. And so I, I do that. <laughs> and I did that in that room, right? But I also know that the Lord loves this other thing just a little bit more than even that, and that's obedience. <laughs> so I said, okay, we're going to start a remodeling company. Actually, you're going to start a remodeling company, and you're going to own it, and I'm just going to work there. And so it's just, it's your deal. I'm just going to work my tail off. And so my income went from $123,000 as this rep that was good to $13,000 a year. And my, as I was crying out to the heavens, see, I told you, I stink at this, <laughs> right? And so after one year, I, got, I started to realize that, man, there's not one nationwide bathroom remodeling company because nobody's done what you have to do to go be a national bathroom remodeling company. And so in a weird twist of things that happened, and God was totally involved in it, I realized that I can get, I can get bathroom appointments for homeowners. And so, um, so we start remodeling these bathrooms, and um, we start killing it. And we're killing it. We're printing money. We're, we're going to Denver, Dallas, Minneapolis, and we're in Kansas City, you know. And um, so we got up to be in this, like, $10 million company. And then we sold it to the Home Depot, and I stayed on for a couple years and ran it, and it was really, really fun. And uh, so in the, course of, in the course of selling the company, I'd come into this relationship with a National Christian Foundation guy who said, if you ever sell your company, um, be sure that you call me first because can, you can change a lot of tax dollars to giving dollars if you structure the sale right. And so I call this guy, and he goes, hey, how much do you want to give? And I said, oh, I don't know. And he goes, well, I got to know that, you know, and time's of the essence. And so I, um, so I went out in the parking lot and I, said, and I said to the Lord, I go, how much of this do you want, you know? He goes, 50%. And I said, you're crazy. I'm not keeping 50%. I don't come from money. I don't, it's not a, really that big a thing for me. I, you need to totally think about, you need to keep more of it because I know how this works. <laughs> Right. I'll take a hundred X in eternity forever over this green stuff, right? That's going to totally pass away. And so I went back to him three times. I'm like, no, I'm serious. You're totally taking more, you know, and he wouldn't have it. He's like, I only require half. <laughs> I'm like, okay. So finally, so finally I have to submit to keeping 50%. And so, so then we sell the Home Depot and I said to the Lord, I said, hey, what do you want? with your money, what do you want me to do with it? Because in the national, it's a donor advice thing, you just give it. And so he goes, I want you to give away 10% of it uh, a year. And so I did it, right? But I got to tell you, something happened to me that day is my heart went to heaven. When you drop, when, you, when, I, when I drop that change in the kingdom, you know, and God put this giant multiple on it, I mean, my heart went there. And my, my view and my looking forward to heaven was greatly intensified that day as I, as I, when, I, when I did that. Um, does anybody have any questions? I want to be sure and end on time. Questions? Kind of an abrupt spot for questions. Yes, sir. What were the three motivations in the Christian life? Fear. Um, to please the Lord and reward. Are there any other questions? Come on, we have four minutes. <laughs> yes, sir, ma'am. How did you evangelize? You said your three um, gifts that God gave you was wisdom, evangelism, and exhortation. 
organization. So um, how did you use evangelism in your work? In my work? How do I use evangelism in my work? I love, love, love leading people to the Lord. Um, the workplace, when you're paying somebody, it's weird and it's really complicated. Now, if a guy's quitting or moving on or something like that, you can go out to lunch and drop it. It's all good, you know. But, <laughs> but no, it can, it's tricky if you're paying somebody, you know, for a lot of reasons and stuff. So great question, though. Any other questions? It's got to be another one. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this institution, for its love for you. God, I just pray that you would um, plant the seeds of eternity in us in a very deep way, in a way that we never lose sight of the coming kingdom of God and how it's totally taken care of and you've already won the battle and you seek to bless your children, God, and you want us to be all about the kingdom. And there's no competition among believers because the kingdom is so enormous and it's so wealthy. Lord, we just ask that um, this would take residence in a very practical, deep way. Uh, in all of us this day. In Christ's name, amen.